Hello and welcome to Designing Your Own Race and Draw. My name is Darren Malloy. I am a third year PhD student here in the Electronic and Electrical Engineering Department. And I'm also the co-auditor of Drone Society. In this lecture, we're just going to have a look at the major components of a drone and how you go about making your own one. First of all, we're just going to have a look back. So the first quad rotor design um, was this Breguet Richer gyroplane. And this was a French design. It did take off. Uh, it wasn't very stable and it didn't stay airborne for too long. Uh, but it was just the first known uh, design of this kind. Um, next up, it was in 1956. It was this Convertalings Model A quad rotor. Uh, this was made by a Dr. George de Batazat and an Ivan Jerome. It was designed for the military, although they didn't end up adopting it. Um, and here's just a little video of it flying. The quad rotor with its multiple rotor design appears complicated, but it offers a radical simplification to the problem of vertical flight. Since the rotors of the quad rotor are half the size of those of the conventional helicopter, they can be operated at higher speed, producing lower vibration levels. In the quad rotor, control is obtained by changes of thrust between rotors. This eliminates the need for the cumbersome cyclic pitch hub mechanisms of the conventional helicopter. In these first flights, the quad rotor showed promise in handling qualities. Mechanical simplicity is achieved by providing identical multiple simple rotors with superior maneuverability. Using four smaller rotors, the quad rotor offers an inherent theoretical advantage. One of the future designs of the quad rotor is a folding flying crane for heavy military equipment and bridge building materials. The Converter Wings Corporation of Amityville, New York, having designed and successfully flown the quad rotor test bed, is now engaged in a contract for a study in the application of this design concept for the Department of the Army. Yeah, okay, so as you've seen there, it actually goes pretty fast, but I don't think I'd like to be piloting it. Um, and then in more recent years, this is going to be a big gap here now, but in more recent years, uh, the development of lithium polymer batteries and more efficient motors has led to the uh, the quadcopter of what you see today. Um, we're just going to take a look at, at now the uses of drones. Um, so obviously you have agriculture. Um, so what they do is they have sprayers at the bottom of drones and you can go cover a large area of, of crop. Uh, videography, uh, that's kind of self-explanatory, just strapping a camera to, to a drone. Racing, uh, 3D mapping of land and structures, uh, search and rescue operations, and uh, even package delivery. We're going to go through these in a bit more detail, what each drone would look like. So obviously you have your agriculture, you have your sprayers, videography, you have a big gimbal on the bottom with a big camera, um, and racing as well. The racing is a smaller, smaller, lighter, um, but more nimble. So videography drones then, they're generally larger to support the heavier cameras and gimbals, um, and also to increase the stability. Um, they have four or more rotors for reliability and lifting power. Generally, the bigger ones have six or eight. Um, eight is generally considered uh, safe in terms of redundancy because you can actually have uh, up to two motors fail and you still wouldn't fall out of the sky. Um, they also have lots of sensors for stability and smooth movement. Um, and they obviously tend to be slower due to the additional weight um, and that increased stability. Okay, so this is a concept for uh, package delivery. Uh, the Amazon Prime Air. It's the autonomous drones being used by Amazon for, for package delivery. Uh, it needs to be efficient and capable of lifting packages, this kind of drone. Uh, it's still an early development stage. Uh, I doubt it'll be available for, for a long while yet. Um, but underneath the picture on the right hand side there, you can actually see some patents that Amazon has, has filed for these kind of honeycomb designs of where the drones can come in, land and, and pick up their packages and head off again. Um, so it's kind of cool that they're thinking ahead like that. So racing drones then, small and lightweight, uh, need to be very fast and agile. The front facing camera sends a video back to the pilot uh, and the pilot sees what the drone sees. So it's similar to virtual reality in terms of the headset. So you put a headset on and you can see out the front of the drone basically. And then you can race against other pilots um, by flying around a predefined course. Okay, so this is just a little clip of myself and my friend uh, racing outside the engineer building. These quadcopters that we're using are actually drone socks uh, quadcopters that we developed um, last year. 
uh, and they're very handy for teaching people uh, drone racing. Uh, they're they're obviously smaller than than proper racing drones, and um, they're they're kind of a mini size, um, but they're quite fun. Uh, and you can see that the quality of the video is quite bad, and that's just because it's analog video. And to get that low latency, you need the uh, you need that kind of quality. And also with a drone that's so small, um, you can't fit too much too much power into it. And there's us on the bench there now. Okay, so then drone form factors. So obviously you have your quadcopter, and that's what most people associate as as a drone. Um, they also you also used to have tricopters. They used to be very popular, um, or the back. Uh, arm would actually pivot and that's how you would how you would control it the two front would be static and the back one would pivot um, and you also have octocopters well hexacopters all kinds of different um, heavier lift ones uh, and I said the benefit of those is that they have redundancy you also have things like fixed wings um, and also fixed wing VTOLs and um, so they are also considered or can be considered drones Okay, so then in motor configurations, uh, you can see here that you can kind of set up a drone however you like. The general most popular one is a quad X, um, but as you can see, you can see this hex there where it's stacked on top of each other. You can have quad uh, I where it's actually the a motor is the front, um, and then you can just see the different configurations there. Okay, then in terms of frame size. The size of the frame used will generally be determined by what the drone will be used for. Uh, frames are generally measured diagonally from motor to opposite motor. So obviously if you have a, if you need to carry a heavy payload, you need a, a larger frame size so that you can have bigger propellers and bigger motors. So just in terms of frame sizes, indoor FPV racers are about 80 mil, uh, outdoor FPV racers are 180 to 250 mil. Um, the lower end aerial drone stuff is about 500 mil, so that's your DJI Phantom and them. And then high end aerial or agricultural drones are normally about a meter, uh, motor to opposite motor. Um, and those are things like the uh, S1000 from DJI and those kind of things. Used in a lot of kind of big Hollywood uh, productions and that. Yeah. So that one there is actually the, S the S1000. Okay. So in then terms of materials, um, so frames can be made from a combination of carbon fiber, plastic, uh, aluminium, and fiberglass. Uh, cheaper indoor drones are, are made from plastic or fiberglass. High-end racing drones are made from carbon fiber sheets uh, with aluminium standoffs separating the bottom and top plates. And then the larger drones are generally made from thick carbon fiber tubes or aluminium. So as you can see there, that's a carbon fiber plate on the top and then the uh, aluminium standoffs to the plate on the bottom. It just sandwiches it together. Okay, so then what's in a drone? So, so if you just think about it in terms of what you input, we can start from here. Uh, so you have your radio transmitter and that's just your, your controller and that sends a wireless signal and that goes into the drone through the uh, radio receiver. The radio receiver then sends that direct signal into the flight controller. The flight controller has all the sensors on board, so it knows, okay, this is what the pilot wants me to do. Uh, this is the control signal that I have to send to each one of the motors. So that generates that control signal and sends it to each one of the electronic speed controllers, or ESCs. The ESCs now have the instruction for what uh, what is needed uh, in terms of motor speed, but they also need to get power separately. So you can't power them directly through the flight controller. So that power comes from the battery uh, through the power distribution board, and then that uh, and that that spins the motor at a certain RPM depending on however the the flight controller wants it to be. So if you hit forward on the uh, radio transmitter, the flight controller will know that you want to go forward, and um, so to do that, it will spin up the back two motors uh, more so that you pitch at an angle, and then you produce a forward uh, thrust vector. Okay, so brushes DC motors. Uh, so picking the correct set of motors for your drone is vital. Uh, thrust versus weight is the main factor that's needed uh, to be considered. Um, so you need a set of motors that can deliver more thrust than your drone will weigh or else it won't fly. So obviously, so if you if your drone is, is 2 kg and your motors, all four of them together, can only lift 2 kg uh, at max throttle 
then there's no way you can't get off the ground. A general rule of thumb is for max efficiency to be at least two, uh, 2x. So if your drone is 1kg, you have motors, all four of your motors can lift uh, 2kg. Um, but that's just a rule of thumb. Propellers then. Uh, so these components are attached to the motors and turn the rotational energy of the motors into upwards lift. So they can be made from plastic or carbon fiber and come in different types and sizes. So plastic propellers are the most popular uh, as they're very cheap, uh, whereas carbon fiber propellers are more durable but expensive. Um, okay. So then the pitch of the propeller. So propeller pitch refers to the angle of attack at which the propeller hits the air. A higher pitched propeller will, re will result in more thrust but use more power and only be efficient at high speeds. A lower pitched propeller has more low end torque, responding to quicker inputs, responding quicker to inputs and using less power. Um, so that's just the current draw as well. Uh, um, because the voltage will be whatever the voltage of the battery is and um, but the higher the pitch the more current is pulled from the battery okay so this is just a quick uh, calculation for what you'd need and um, so in terms of propeller size so the frame that you pick for your drone will determine the size of the propellers that you can be used while well, the max size and um, so using five inch propellers the motor will need to run a lot faster than using 12 inch propellers to generate the same amount of thrust so motors that run Smaller propellers usually run faster with less torque, uh, usually more than 2000 kV, uh, whereas motors that run large propellers uh, rotate slower but with more torque, so generally less than 1000 kV. So the motor on the left is rated at 2300 kV and the motor on the right is rated at 390 kV. So then the battery and power systems. So uh, drones are normally powered using lithium polymer batteries. Uh, so this type of battery offers a high power to weight ratio uh, and can deliver extremely high currents. Um, so this is your generic uh, LiPo battery. Um, so you see here you have your balance lead and your main lead. Uh, your balance lead um, can be used to check the voltage or when it's charging. So you can charge each cell. So there's four individual batteries in this battery and you, you need to charge them all to the same level. Um, but they're also hooked together and that can, all that current can be uh, used at once through the main lead. Um, so just that the ratings then, so your cell count and voltage is here, so you have 4S. 14.8 uh, is the nominal voltage for a 4S battery. Uh, your C rating is the amount of current that you can deliver at a certain time. Um, so you say 50, say that's 50 C there, you say uh, 50 multiplied by the capacity in amps, so it's 50 times 1.5 and um, so that's 75 amps it can deliver. Your capacity is here, so that's 1500 milliamp hours um, or just 1.5 amp hours, but they generally keep them in milliamp hours. Okay, so power distribution. A power distribution board or PDB is normally used to link the power to the ESCs, uh, flight controller, receiver, FPV equipment and other accessories. They have high current connections uh, for ESCs and a regulated 5 volt supply for the flight controller receiver, etc. Um, so this, this uh, get my laser here. Uh, so these are all the motor connections along the side here. Uh, and this is the um, 5 volt and 12 volt regulator. Uh, so you can plug in any 5 volt equipment here or uh, solder in, in any, any 12 volt equipment here. Um, and that's just a generic uh, layout for, for PDB. So these, in this case, these two pads here are where your battery connectors go. Okay, so then in terms of picking a motor, propeller and battery, uh, so to determine which motor and propeller combination is correct for your drone, you must first calculate the all-up weight. The all-up weight is the total weight of your drone with all components included. Uh, using this weight you can look at data sheets for different motors to determine what motor, propeller and battery combination suits. Okay, so we have here um, a certain type of motor. That's this motor over here on the right. Um, this, those are two different types. There's a 2300 uh, RPM per volt and there's also a 2600 RPM per volt version. By the way, the KV that I referred to, um, sorry, I should have explained this, the KV is it's RPM per volt. It's not kilovolt, and I'm not too sure where the KV comes from, but it actually means RPM per volt. Um, so that's why we multiplied them here. 
So in this case, uh, a 2300 uh, RPM per volt motor um, on a 14.8 or 4S battery, you can actually utilize a, a 4 inch propeller with a 4.5 inch pitch propeller. You can go up to a 5.5 inch pitch and you can go as low as a 3 inch pitch. Um, so it's pretty middle of the road. So that tells you how much current that, that setup pulls for one motor is 27.6 amps. Um, and it tells you how much uh, pull you're running at. So it's 950 grams. And you can also see the, the uh, efficiencies here at running on different combinations. Um, so obviously you're gonna have four motors. So with this combination, you could almost have a drone. With four of these motors, you could almost have an all up weight of about two kg and you'd be all right. Um, maybe you run a small, a small bit lighter. So electronic speed controllers or ESCs are what make the motor actually turn. Um, so they use the power from the battery and they take instructions from the flight controller. So to get the instructions, the flight controller sends a PWM signal to the ESC, which is just a certain type of signal. Um, and the only consideration needed when picking an ESC is whether it's rated for the power that the motor and propeller combo will pull based on the data sheet in the previous slide. So you can see here, this is a, a 40 amp ESC um, and in the previous slide we can see that it pulls a load of 27.6 so that's like something you'd need maybe uh, for this combination just to give some headroom um, you know just to give some headroom in that uh, so the ESCs don't heat up too much okay so transmitters and receivers so the uh, drones are usually controlled using a controller with a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter link to the receiver in the drone. Uh, this uses similar technology to Wi-Fi, but it's much more reliable and has a greater range of around uh, one kilometer to five kilometers. Some systems provide telemetry data where the drone can send information back to the controller, like the uh, voltage of the battery, which is very handy. Okay, so obviously you have your inputs into this, into this controller uh, and then the drone has this receiver on board and that, as we said before, goes into the flight controller uh, to give the commands. All right, so controlling a drone. So you have your transmitter up here. Um, so this is your left stick and this is your right stick. Uh, and there's, it's kind of the same as the PlayStation, except the throttle, it doesn't bounce back to the middle. So if you set your throttle to 100% and take your finger off, it'll stay at 100% and it won't bounce back to the middle like it would on a, on a PlayStation controller. Okay, so on the left stick, you have your throttle up and down. So that's just moving the, the stick up and down. Uh, you go from zero to 100% throttle. Generally, well, what you aim for is 50% throttle to be uh, stationary. But with certain with certain drones, it depends on your thrust to weight ratio, where that, where that percentage falls. Uh, then you also have on your left stick is yaw left and yaw right. And uh, what that does is it's, this is looking down on top of a drone. It twists it, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Then on your right hand side, if you push the right stick to the top, uh, that is a pitch down. Uh, so pitch is here, so this is the side of the drone. Uh, if you push the the stick to the top, you're actually pitching this down the way, so that it'll pitch like this. The back will go up, and that will give you a forward uh, thrust vector, and that will make it go forward. Depending on the actual mode, uh, in some cases, if you pitch up and if you hold that pitch up what you'll actually do is you'll do a, a flip a front flip and um, whereas with other modes what you can do is if you hold pitch down uh, then you just go forward uh, so it depends on the mode you're in uh, generally with, with racing and with freestyle um, it's the other way where it's just where these sticks control your rate of angular velocity whereas in, say in videography the actual sticks control uh, your direction. So it's just forward, backward, side to side. Okay, so flight controllers. So there's a lot of different flight controllers that can be used uh, to keep the aircraft stable. Uh, so you have your CC3D, NAS32, or Omnibus. And um, you can see the Omnibus down here. That's kind of the only modern one in that list. This is your CC3D. This is kind of where it started from. So this is an Arduino Nano, uh, and this is just an, an IMU, so it's your sensors. And basically they connected them with a PCB. It's just a printed circuit board. Um, so multi-wee flight controller. That's the first kind of multi-wee. And then once they actually got an aircraft stable with this setup, uh, what they did was they, they printed the whole thing. 
So they also printed the, you know, instead of just printing a socket for an Arduino Nano and an IMU, they just printed it so that they could solder directly onto the PCB. And this is, became the first flight controller, so this was the multi -Wii, um So this is multi -Wii basically using other components, other companies' components. Um, but this was the first uh, proper multi -Wii, uh, that you could buy. And uh, they were actually great crack. You program them through the same software uh, that you you program this guy through. Uh, so it's just through, through Arduino. Then came along CC3D. Um, but there's, there's a lot more history there in that, so there's a lot bigger steps in between each one of these and the current most up-to-date one is the Amibus there. Okay, and there is way more advanced ones than the than the Omnibus uh, available like the Pixhawk, um, APM, but I think they're gone now. Okay, so then just in terms of what, what would be needed to know if you were to build a racing drone, uh, so they take instructions from the receiver and they output PWM signals to the ESCs that in turn move the motors. Uh, so the new boards also have the ability to take in the analog video from an FPV camera and overlay an OSD or on-screen display onto the image and then output that back uh, into the, onto the, the FPV transmitter. On your, on your screen then, on your image through your goggles, you can actually see, uh, say for example, the voltage, even your speed if you have a GPS hooked up and it's very handy. Okay, so we're just gonna use the Omnibus F4 as an example. Uh, so this is the pinout diagram uh, that you use to connect up the other components and you get this when you're buying the uh, the flight controller, this is what you'll get on the website. Uh, so you can see here at the top right you have your receiver input, as we talked about the receivers before, then you have your ESC output and this is the PWM signal that we were talking about as well. Up here you can see you put in your camera, your camera feed and your VTX. So the camera feed, the image from the camera goes into the camera, into the flight controller. It adds an, an on-screen display and then it goes back out to the uh, video transmitter, is the VTX. You can also add things like buzzers, LED strips, current sensors, and lots of other different things. Okay, so then in terms of sensors, on the flight controller, uh, there's a gyroscope, accelerometer, barometer, magnetometer, uh, well, ultrasonic sometimes, and a GPS again sometimes. Okay, so a gyro basically tells you the uh, tells you the rate of change of the drone. So it can it can sense when stuff is turning. Uh, the accelerometer basically measures acceleration in different directions. Uh, so depending on what way it's tilted, it can tell you how how it's tilted. And the two of these combined can actually make the drone stable. Then the barometer can tell you how high off the ground or high off the sea level the drone is and that uses pressure and um, so obviously the higher you go up uh, the less pressure so using that they can they can roughly measure the uh, the height but it's not too accurate um, the magnetometer then is like a compass uh, so that can tell you which way is north uh, then you have your ultrasonic your ultrasonic is really only in the kind of videography ones drones where you want it to avoid objects or avoid the ground so you can have it facing straight down to make sure that it doesn't hit the ground. Uh, and then GPS is very handy, the GPS over the right hand side. So with GPS and magnetometer you can actually fly uh, completely autonomous missions and this is used a lot in surveying um, because you can just set the drone up and it'll just set it a path and then it'll just go fly that path itself and you don't have to control it at all and that's very useful. Okay, so these are the flight modes that I was talking about. Um, so you have your acro or normal mode. So the pitch and roll inputs determine how fast the drone will rotate on that axis. In this mode, uh, it requires stick input to manually return the drone to level. So if you move the pitch, um, say if you move the pitch down, uh, then the drone will, will tilt forward. It'll stay tilted forward and it'll be locked at that angle until you pitch that up. Uh, the angle horizon mode then uh, remains uh, level without stick input. So if you just up the throttle, you don't have to touch any stick input and the drone will, will remain level. Uh, the pitch and roll is limited to a particular angle and the drone will not flip in angle, uh, but will flip in horizon. Horizon is, uh, is kind of angle, but except at the extreme limit of the, uh, of the stick, it will just flip the drone. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend using that. So angle, angle is really the one where 
what people are kind of most used to, um, I'd say from flying like toy drones, um, but it's also what's used in the videography and the agricultural, the slower kind of drones. Um, so yeah, their pitch and roll is limited to a, cer to a certain angle so that uh, when you pitch forward or pitch down, that it just goes forward as opposed to doing loads of flips. Okay, altitude hold. Uh, so the drone will maintain the same altitude using the barometer or the altimeter, or if a GPS is hooked up, it would also use that to hold the altitude. And then GPS hold uh, will keep the drone in the same position in space using the GPS sensor data. So that's in three three axes. So it's not only just holding the altitude, but it's holding the altitude, uh, longitude and latitude. Okay, so this is the Skydio R1. This isn't a racing drone, but it's just a kind of cutting edge in terms of uh, flight controllers, if you will. Uh, so it has 13 cameras all around it. It has a neural network engine, and it can actually track where it's, where the drone is in space itself. And then it can fly itself as if it's being flown by a human, just tracking a certain object. So I'm just going to play this this uh, this uh, introductory video of it. Okay, so that's the Skydio R1. I think they have an R2 out now, this stage. Um, but it's just the, the kind of, for you to get a feel of how far you can take this technology and how far that it's actually come, so that, that that drone is actually flying itself and just tracking someone. And um, so this is just what is basically under the hood uh, in terms of that camera, in terms of that drone. So there's 12 exterior cameras and one main camera. Uh, the 12 navigation cameras are just around the outside of it. Uh, and this is kind of a look into how it processes the data. Drones came onto the scene four or five years ago, and I think they really captured people's imagination with all the incredible concepts that are out there. There's this general notion of an autonomous flying camera that can follow you around and capture amazing video, but the paradigm with existing products is you essentially need an expert pilot there flying it. And if you have that, you can do incredible things, but for most people and for most applications, the potential is still a little bit out of reach. In a lot of ways, this feels like a product that we've been working on for most of our lives. I met my co-founders, Abe and Matt, when we were grad students at MIT, where our lab was one of the first in the world to develop autonomous flying systems. We worked on a, a fixed-wing vehicle that could use lasers and cameras to fly itself around a parking garage at high speed. And really, the goal of that project was to do something that would go beyond the capabilities of even what the best pilots in the world were capable of. And at the time, it was just sort of a fun, interesting challenge to be working on. But a lot of what we learned there forms the foundation for what we've built now at Skydio. Our initial focus has been to deliver on that promise of the autonomous flying camera and to make it real. Basically, to create a film crew that fits in your backpack. It's a camera that understands the scene it's looking at and has the ability to move itself. Those two things together are just enormously powerful. This is a very ambitious product, and to make it possible, we had to develop custom hardware. We built a device with 13 cameras that see in every direction, and at its core, it uses an NVIDIA TX1. It's the same thing that's found in self-driving cars, and that's what runs the Skydio autonomy engine. The first step in the vision processing pipeline is understanding where the vehicle is and how it's moving. To do this, we look for regions of high texture in the environment, and we track those as landmarks in the real world that we can triangulate and track our motion. That motion estimate is the foundation for everything else we do. 
the next step in the processing pipeline is building up a 3D understanding of the world. To do that, we compute stereo depth maps from each pair of cameras, and these get fused over time into a dense 3D understanding of the environment. From there, the R1 uses a combination of deep neural networks to understand the people around it. It knows what people look like, and for every person it sees, it builds up a unique visual identifier that it can use to tell people apart so that it can stay locked on to the right subject. The motion planning system turns all the information about the environment into useful action, so it balances avoiding obstacles, keeping the subject in view, and capturing amazing video to figure out how the vehicle should behave by predicting four seconds into the future. These planning commands get turned into action in the physical world in rotor speeds and gimbal angles. This is an incredibly complex system, but the end result is simple. The vehicle moves itself in a beautiful, smooth, cinematic way to capture amazing video. Okay, so that's the autonomy engine. Um, so you can see, kind of get somewhat of an insight into how those projects come together. Uh, the NVIDIA TX1 definitely isn't used in any useful self-driving cars, like they just said. Um, but it's still a really cool application, and it's cool that such limited hardware can can have such a such a cool application and actually work so well. And um, so, as you heard them say that they they predict four seconds into the future. Using the 12 cameras is how they generate this map here that you can see. Um, so they can see how far away each of these, um, basically how far away these objects are. And using that they can they can uh, make a trajectory uh, with which they want to fly. Um, so it's very cool. Okay, so now let's get back to drone racing. Um, so in drone racing, there's the FPV system. Um, so FPV is a video downlink used to see what the drone sees in real time. So it's used by FPV freestylers and racers, and it puts you inside the drone. Um, so to set up the FPV on any drone, you only need two things. So it's goggles with the receiver and then camera with a transmitter. So this is a camera with a transmitter here, and this is the goggles with a receiver. So you put on the goggles and you can see out this camera, and all you need is a five volt supply. So it's very cool. It's very low latency. It's not the best quality. There is digital ones out there now, um, but there wasn't even a couple of months ago, um, and they're very expensive. It's like 900 euro or something. It's a, it's obviously by DJI, who are the overall leaders in uh, drone technology at the moment, um, and they're even kind of coming into the racing drone space at the moment, um, where they, they've kind of left that behind uh, up until now. Okay, so FPV cameras. Um, so digital cameras such as a GoPro, can't be used uh, due to the processing time being too high. So a specific camera is needed to ensure low latency. Uh, the FPV cameras are usually specifically designed for their purpose. Um, so they're literally a lens, uh, a camera, uh, a, a, and CMOS sensor under here, uh, and then there's a very little processing, and it goes straight out. That's the back there. There is some processing, but very little processing. Um, and then it goes straight out to the video transmitter. So the video transmitter. Uh, digital transmitters are generally too slow or too expensive, um, so analog technology is the most common. And as I said before, there has been digital uh, FPV systems come out recently, um, but if, you wanna, if, if you're getting into it, more than likely you're, you're getting the, the analog uh, technology. So it's similar to old analog TV signals, um, but they're extremely low latency. Uh, the power output and antenna type determines the range. So a 250 uh, milliwatt usable is usable up to about a kilometer. Um, maybe a bit less. Depends, depends on a lot of things. Depends if there's a lot of metal around. Um, it really depends. So the, these are two different types of antennas. This is a cloverleaf antenna. And generally you're supposed to match these, but this is just stock images. Uh, and this is just a linear antenna here. Okay, so goggles then, um, so they're like VR type goggles <coughs> that's used to view the video signal from the drone. 
Um, goggles have been have built in receivers to pick up the signal from the drone. Uh, and you can see this is actually another cloverleaf antenna here, except it's um, it's covered. It's covered by a plastic shroud. Um, and they're generally analog signals are used to uh, reduce latency, and the resolution is quite low, so about 320 by 240. You can get up to um, about 720p, I think. This is an example of the of the uh, professional uh, videography type uh, digital downlink from from DJI. Um, this is the light bridge. Uh, so you can see here you have your remote input going into this light bridge. The light bridge is also on to, on the drone then as well. And um, you can see it's a big hefty yoke. But they've actually come down in size and, and in price. This would be a couple of grand, but the actual new DJI system is 900 um, and it's 1080p. So it's quite good. Okay, so then FPV racing, the sport itself. So it's an international sport where pilot races, where pilots race their drones around a course. Uh, the drones can reach up to 200 kilometers an hour or more, uh, making them very difficult to control. Uh, and FPV racing is a very new sport, but it's gained a lot of popularity recently. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a few videos here of people um, in FPV races, uh, and then we'll come back. Okay, and finally then we're just going to talk quickly about drone attachments. Um, so drones are very useful for other things other than just flying them for, for fun or for sport. Um, so you can attach uh, cameras, gimbals, uh, you can attach radar and lidar systems, uh, sprayers for agriculture, uh, and even medical supplies. Okay, so obviously you have your racer here on the left hand side uh, with a GoPro. Um, on the right hand side here you have a, a gimbal that carries a GoPro so it just smooths out the image a bit more. Uh, these be used for, for kind of, um, well for videography but these ones aren't too common. Generally you have what I showed you in the start which was the S1000 with the massive uh, red camera on top, on top of it with a big massive gimbal uh, and an octocopter to carry it. So that's more common in terms of gimbals for, for videography. Um, so there's this kind of a, a system, but this one's actually carrying a LiDAR. So LiDAR on a drone is very handy for 3D mapping. So as I said before, if you have a GPS and this one has three uh, GPS antennas on it, what you can do is you can generate a, a point cloud map, uh, which basically makes you a makes a 3D model of the surface of whatever you're mapping. It can be used for, for agriculture, it can be used for structures, um, it can be used for a lot of things. 
and this kind of thing is actually very handy for for research as well so as part of my research i photo i um did a thing called photogrammetry which is where you basically stitch uh images together so a uh, drawn aerial image where the image is face down from the drone uh, and you have a series of images as well, as well as their gps coordinates and what you can do from those series of images is that you can stitch them together into a 3d object so i modeled the entire campus for my uh, for my phd and that let me find out basically the best uh, the best areas for aut for autonomous driving and any issues that we could find um in the route okay um and then for agriculture as well you can see here a sprayer so you have your whatever your your nutrient here is or pesticide or whatever and you can see it's just spraying it there out also medical supplies so these this is a a um, example of a defib uh, drone where it's a defibrillator built into it uh, and this is just in terms of like package delivery they also did a test run on posted a kind of a test run uh, where they put insulin on a drone and they flew it out to the iron islands just as a kind of a test Okay, and this is the last slide. So this is just showing off, um, basically showing off my drones. Uh, so I got into the hobby with uh, this drone. So it's a 500 mil, and I originally wanted it for videography. Um, back then, the, the DJI Phantoms that were very expensive. So this was probably six years ago, if not longer. Um, I also got into uh, 3D printing. As you can see inside here, barely, there's the actual multi-Wii. Um, and then I moved into racing drones, and this is my current racing drone. Uh, these are my friend's drones. Um, so these are, this is his, his tricopter and an older version of a racing drone. It's a bit bigger, and this is his current racing drone. So this is a 210 mil frame, and this is a 250. Um, so that's just what we current, currently fly with. Um, and you can see the GoPro on this one as well. Uh, it's just good for getting the high definition video. So yeah, if you have any questions, just email me. Uh, my email is there. Uh, and please, if you're interested, um, be sure to join DroneSock. I'm not too sure when we'll have uh, events again. Um, but we have equipment there and we have simulators. So you can actually learn to fly uh, racing drones through simulators. And also just a really, really good learning community in, in Drone Society. Um, so we're teaching a lot of people how to fly, teaching a lot of other people how to actually build their own, their own racing drones. And we're going to get more and more equipment each year. So that's it. That's the end of the lecture. Uh, I hope you learned a bit about racing drones and I hope um, I've interested some of you to look at in, into it a bit more. Um, and yeah, please do join uh, Drone Talk if you're interested. Okay, thanks guys.